Take it away. Hello, I am Hank Chambers, a law professor down at the University of Richmond, and I'll tell, tell there we go. And my other judges are now unmuted. So good to see you all. Hi, my name is Thomas Mackey. I'm in the history department at the University of Louisville, and as well as with the Brandeis School of Law at U of L. Good morning. I'm Rita McCannon. I'm a lawyer in Huntsville, Alabama, and I'm so excited to hear you all, to hear what you have to say, and I'm so impressed that you were willing to do this for us. Thank you. Um, um, tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Tyler Cummings. Uh, I'm a junior at Clay County High School. I'm Hayden Morris. I am a senior. I'm Zoe Davis. I'm also a junior. Um, we're representing West Virginia. We're excited to be here. And this is our instructor, Mr. Phil Dobbins. Fantastic. It is great to see you all. Glad to, to see you all representing uh, the Mountaineer State properly. My wife grew up in, in down in Bluefield. Um, so good to see you all and look forward to a good conversation. This is question three, unit three. So let me read it and then we will hear your opening. In 2020, we celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which recognized the right of women to vote. Despite recent controversy, the Equal Rights Amendment has not yet been declared ratified. What are the similarities and differences between these two amendments? What impact, if any, has the 19th Amendment had on women in achieving equality with men in the United States and around the world? What are the advantages and disadvantages of states passing their own equal rights amendments rather than ratifying a national constitutional amendment? We look forward to your opening. The 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920, gave women in the United States the right to vote. However, while being a step in the right direction, this did not put women on equal footing with men. In 1923, Alice Paul proposed the Equal Rights Amendment to those attending the Seneca Falls Convention. The ERA states that equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It would guarantee all women in the U.S. equal rights concerning divorce, employment, poverty, and the pay gap. According to the Economic Policy Institute, women are paid less than men at every wage level with African-American, Asian, and Hispanic, Hispanic women making even less to the, due to their race. The ERA also looks to include transgender individuals in its scope. In 26 states, there is no legal protection for transgender people in the workplace, and advocates of the ERA are seeking to fix this with the passing of the amendment, though this aspect requires further clarification due to the difference between sex and gender. Sex refers to one's biology, while gender refers to one's identification. Currently, 38 states have passed the Equal Rights Amendment, which is enough to ratify, but due to the deadline having run out before the final states vote and several states wanting to withdraw their votes, the amendment is currently in the air. Susan B. Anthony said, there will never be complete equality until women themselves help to make laws and elect lawmakers. Before the 19th Amendment, several women took public office and the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 occurred, but voting rights were still an important step to equality. In fact, directly after African-American men were deemed citizens, the 15th Amendment gave them the right to vote. Figureheads of the women's suffrage movement, such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, disapproved of this because they disagreed with the lack of voting rights for African-American women. The 19th Amendment had an outstanding impact on equality of women and men in the U.S. because women's chances in the workplace and workplace rights increased dramatically. In 1916, Janet Rankin was the first woman to serve in Congress, and now today the number stands at 26 women. Around the world, women continue to be oppressed and or silenced by their representatives and government. But due to, due to women having rights in the U.S., women elsewhere are encouraged to stand up and speak out. One such example is Malala Yousafzai, who in 2012, at the age of 15, stood up against the oppressive attitude of the Taliban towards young, young girls' education. Malala survived being shot in the head several times and became the youngest person to earn a Nobel Peace Prize and continues to fight for women's rights today. On January 15, 2020, Virginia's General Assembly passed a ratification resolution for the ERA proposed by Congress in 1972, becoming the 38th state out of 38 needed to ratify. An argument can be made that, made that a national constitutional amendment would be an advantage for all Americans because it would provide a fundamental legal remedy against sex discrimination and guarantee citizens' constitutional rights regardless of sex. The ERA would cause sex to be considered a suspect classification, along with race, which means that governmental actions that treat males or females differently as a class would be subject to strict judicial scrutiny. 
Some argue that the passing of a national ERA would not protect those who do not classify as male or female. And according to Phyllis Shafley, an opponent of said amendment, it would give federal courts and the federal government enormous new powers to reinterpret every law that makes a distinction based on gender, such as those related to marriage, divorce, and alimony. Some citizens say the benefits of having their state uh, ERAs applies to them more consistently throughout their daily, daily lives and that it's easier for states to pass amendments. But the argument still continues to be made that a national ERA would benefit all citizens by giving equality between the sexes on the highest level possible of legal protection, filling any gaps left open by, left open by individual laws. Nevada State Senator Pat Spearman commented on the prospect of Virginia's ratification of the amendment, saying there is no shelf life for equality. Fantastic. So, so should we just have a stronger interpretation of the 14th Amendment? Would that get us all that an Equal Rights Amendment would get us? Um, it, well, well, with a, like in some states, there's actually uh, something like this. They call it their Equal Rights Amendment or something like that for their citizens. And it's actually in their uh, state constitutions, but it's the language is closely resembling that of the 14th Amendment. Now, with the 14th Amendment and it establishing uh, citizen rights and who is a citizen and who's not a citizen, yes, I could see why states would put that in there, but the ERA on the federal level uh, just, just clears out any holes in uh, our federal government system and could possibly even uh, solve uh, this pay gap that we talk about so much and that uh, a lot of people seem that, uh, think that, thinks that it exists or it does. Okay. Um, I think that the best possible option for this country would be to restart the ERA entirely. In fact, there have been several people who are behind this plan, such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice, who say that the ERA as it stands, the legality of it isn't entirely sure. It's kind of a gray area. And it would probably be best just to start over entirely and make it more specific to the changing world today in regards to the transgender and non-binary individuals. Um, I would have to agree with both of my teammates. If you would look at the Equal Rights Clause in the, um, the 14th Amendment, it does give certain um, rights and standards for citizens in the United States. But if you'd also look at our political climate today with um, movements such as the Me Too movement, you can see that um, sort of there is a difference in the way that society treats male and female individuals, which means that just strengthening the Equal Rights Clause, I do not feel would be enough. I have to agree with Zoe when she says that um, to restart and remake the ERA and have it be passed and sent through um, voting again, it would benefit. Do, do you think the ERA has a chance of passing if we put in gender along with sex? Uh, yes. I, I, in fact, I, I would say that it even has a stronger chance of passing. Like, like my teammates mentioned all this about uh, our current political climate. I feel now more than ever, especially with uh, the 2015 case Oberfell versus Hodges and that relating to uh, uh, the passing and the legality of gay marriage uh, nationwide, I feel that with the political climate shifting towards that and shifting towards a minority of people who want to be represented and have their rights, I feel like now, especially today in our United States of America, that it has the chance to pass more now than ever, especially if we restart it. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Tyler. I think it would have a hard chance passing if we added gender into it because with the political polarization we see today between Republicans and Democrats, um, our Senate is dominated by Republicans and it would take an equal amount of vote from the Senate as it would the House. And I think honestly, if we added gender and made it more specific, there's a good chance that Republicans would not vote to ratify. Yeah. Let me follow up on a point Ms. Morris made a moment ago, and because I'm a little confused or fuzzy that on one hand we need constitutional amendment and adjustments to the fundamental document. On the other hand, it's all about cultural change. So which comes first? And help me understand the relationship here between cultural change in this constitutional additions uh, that you've been talking about well cultural change is gonna cultural change is gonna be harder to come by due to the fact of such uh, political polarization in our country 
but legality and a constitutional amendment should come first and, w and would come first with the passing of this ERA. And it would have legislation put in place for protection of transgender people and so something that's a broad area in the original ERA. So the legality and the, constitu and the constitutionality would come first, whereas the cultural change would eventually adapt over time. Now, that can be called into question due to people's personal beliefs and uh, their religions. But to answer your question, I believe that uh, what would come first would be the, constitutional, the constitutionality and their rights for every citizen of this uh, Equal Rights Amendment. Um, I have to agree with Tyler. There, um, what happens is there are, the amendment would have to come first because it would set a precedent for the rest of the states um, in the United States to follow it would um, put into place, hopefully, protections, uh, like Tyler said, for transgender individuals. There are currently 28 states that do not have these protections in place, so there aren't um, protections in place for transgender, transgender individuals in the workplace, which means that they can be fired for um, being transgender, even though this isn't viewed very well, but it can happen, so it would also help to do that. And I'm hearing this is a symbolic change, not a substantive change, that substantive change would have to follow. Um, I think that our Constitution is a living, breathing document. It moves with the people. So as we evolve as a people, we need to evolve our laws. And right now we are seeing a rise in the number of transgender and non-binary individuals, and we need to follow along with that and make sure that their basic rights are protected. So it would be a substantive issue because it's their rights. Y'all made and, it Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, and to add on to that, I mean, we would see with, uh, depending on how a lot of uh, courts would act, judicial activism and looking at it and seeing how it can adapt to current times. And like we mentioned, uh, strict judicial scrutiny and seeing if the constitution, constitutionality of the amendment is equal for everyone, where it would go through a strict, thorough process um, of seeing and deeming uh, whether or not that amendment is uh, uh, constitutional. Great. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Let, let's hear uh, comments from my fellow judges. Look, I think this is a tougher topic than it sounds or on at first blush. There's very complicated issues here of law, culture, and society, and social change. Uh, I think you laid out the issues very well. Um, would have liked, I'm a historian, I, I would have liked to have seen a little more connection over time, but if that's all I got to pick on, that ain't much, so you did a really nice job, I thought, uh, and I was uh, really glad to hear uh, the discussions you had in, from Seneca Falls to the 15th Amendment uh, forward, so I thought it was a nice job, folks. I did too. I, I come from a state where we have a We've had a Supreme Court Chief Justice who said we don't have to do what the Supreme Court in Washington says. That's frightening, and I'm glad you guys knew that there needs to be some uh, some some definite change, and not just social change, to get people to uh, do do the right thing. Sometimes I I really appreciated what you had to say about. Um, giving giving people equal rights and how you brought it forward. I would like to have heard a little more maybe case law or a little more history brought into it, but you had a you had a good grasp on what I consider to be very difficult. And you go, wait till you have a daughter and and how much it's gonna bother you that some of these things some of these things happen to us. No, I, I think those are those are good points. Uh, raising the gender question and the sex question is a real, real interesting piece of the puzzle. Uh, one of the things that I do is employment discrimination uh, teaching, and we certainly have cases right now that have gone in front of the, the, the Supreme Court that are going to ask or deal with the question of whether sex includes gender under Title VII. And it, it'll, it'll be quite interesting to, to think about that and what the, the blowback might well be saw the clash from you guys on whether it would make it easier or harder to ratify an amendment if it had gender involved as well. Uh, I think it's interesting. I, I am, I'm, I'm hoping that Tyler's right. 
I suspect that Zoe's right. Uh, so, so but yeah. I'm hoping, right? But I'm hoping. Uh, so, so we'll see how it how it goes. But I thought it was a wonderful conversation, and and I appreciate it. And I hope that you yeah. guys have a, a great rest of the rest of the competition, and uh, we'll see how things go tomorrow. Right. Aiden, tell us where you're going to school in the fall. Uh, me? Yes. Oh, I'm. Uh, I think I'm going to go to West Liberty University to study zoology. Okay. Cool. Good deal. Well, well I'm, 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 I, I assume that you guys are not going to do a, an in-person graduation. And for that, I'm very sorry. I've got a, a, a college senior who's, who's in that boat. Uh, but I hope you find a really good way to celebrate uh, because God knows you deserve it. So, Legally. And, celebrate and, legally. And Zoe and Tyler, presumably you guys will be in person next year in class. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. So. Yeah, hopefully.